All right, hello everybody. Thanks for being here today. Uh, and a welcome to everybody who's watching on the live stream from our other offices. Um, my name's Alex Seide, and we're really excited today to welcome Alexander Rose to Google. Um, Alexander's the executive director of the Long Now Foundation, based right here in San Francisco. Uh, and some of you may be familiar with their work around the Rosetta Project, Long Bets Initiative, some other things. Um, but surely they're best known for the 10,000 year clock, uh, which is a project that Alexander's been working on for the last couple of decades. So very excited to have him here to, to talk about that. And without further ado, I'll let him take it away. Thank you. Hello, everybody. The, this project really started um, with a story, and it was, um, it, it was started by a, a group of people um, who were largely part of the first wave of Silicon Valley, people uh, like Stuart Brand and Esther Dyson. And uh, there was this story about these beams at the New College, Oxford. And there's these beams that went over the main, uh, the main dining hall. And they were, when this was, college was built, it was in the 1200s. It was the new college of, of the day. Um, and it was these huge oak beams. Um, but 500 years later, uh, in the 1800s, these had become rotted and infested with beetles. And the problem was you couldn't really just buy timber like this in Europe anymore. It had mostly been harvested. And it wasn't until uh, they spoke to the school forester who said, oh, well, we have the grove of oaks that you planted. And it turned out that they had, the practice of the time was you planted groves to be harvested hundreds of years later to replace these kind of beams. Uh, and so it was this simple story that when Stuart Brand, uh, who had founded the Whole Earth Catalog, uh, told it to Danny Hillis, who had been designing some of the fastest supercomputers during the 80s with think his company Thinking Machines out of MIT, where Danny realized that you know, we aren't really thinking like this anymore. We aren't using these simple leverages over very long periods of time. And in fact, by not thinking over these kind of timescales, there's some problems that we've taken totally off the table. So you could imagine you know, climate change, if somebody said, you need to solve it in four years, you're like, I can't do that. But if someone said 400 years, you could imagine how you might start that project. And we basically, by not giving ourselves these kind of time frames to work on things, we've basically just taken these, these types of problems off the table. And so the idea was to, uh, to create a kind of an example of long-term thinking. And as I mentioned, Danny Hillis uh, was, was inspired very early on, and he had been building uh, very, very fast computers. And he had this idea of building not the fastest computer, but actually the slowest computer in the world. A computer, effectively, that was a clock that was calculating the heavens uh, and, the, and the date over 10,000 years, this kind of time frame of human civilization. And Stuart, who had been talking with him about this, he had started the whole Earth catalog, as I mentioned. And he thought, well, that's that's great if we get people's attention around uh, long-term thinking, this kind of monument scale, all mechanical thing that, that gets people talking in a different way about long-term projects. But what do we do with that? And he wanted to create a kind of a library, an information service that would last over the same kind of time scale. And then Brian Eno, who uh, was one of the other people that started to be pulled into this conversation, a uh, musician and artist, he had this idea of the long now, which uh, when he, uh, he had grown up in England, and when he first moved to New York in the 70s, he went to a friend's house, and, uh, and it was in a really horrible neighborhood. He was like stepping over homeless people to get into it. And when he asked if she liked living there, she said, yes, I love it here. And he realized that the here for her was right between those walls. And in New York, they also meant, when they said now, they meant the kind of five minutes that they were in, not the larger time that they were in. And so he kind of started contrasting the long now uh, and the big here with what people were, were understanding in New York versus Europe. Um, and so we kind of used that term to really stretch it out as to the, the larger human moment. And then this other set of people who, uh, as I mentioned, are, are very much part of the early uh, wave here in Silicon Valley. And I think they, they were really seeing uh, some of the speeding up of culture that we're definitely now deep, you know, kind of hip deep in now uh, back then. And they, they, were, they were realizing that there needed to be some kind of counteractive to that. And that was why they all got together and started the Long Now Foundation. And I was hired uh, in the uh, late 
90s, about, uh, mid-1997, to start working with Danny Hillis on building this clock. And uh, I'm going to talk about some of the lessons that we've learned about how to build things over that can last over a thousand years, and uh, some of the lessons we have from antiquity. And then I'm also going to um, dive into some of the, the exact details of the project right now, and in fact, some of the pictures that have been taken uh, from the site that's where we're building the monument scale version in West Texas uh, will be, um, that I just took a few weeks ago, really. So this idea of 10,000 years um, really came first from this, uh, a conversation about, you know, what is, what is the right time scale for us to be working in? And if you want to stretch people's imagination around time, but if you start working with the kind of galactic time scale, these kind of billions of years, the whole human experience becomes totally dwarfed. So that's not what we wanted. And even if you start looking at millions of years on this geologic time scale, it's still a dwarfing experience. It's very difficult to feel as though you have an effect in it. But this idea of the last and the next 10,000 years, where it's kind of the, the last ice age retreated, we had uh, some of the first uh, agriculture and cities, this, this was really what we wanted to capture as the human moment. And I think the most important part of this is, is not really thinking about ourselves as the kind of end of a 10,000 year story, but more in the middle of at least a 20,000 year story of modern humanity. And if you start thinking about yourself that way and the projects that you're working on, uh, how would you act differently? And one of the very first kind of diagrams that, we, that came out of a conversation uh, with Brian Eno and Stuart Brand was this one of this kind of layers of human time, this pace layering, where you have the, the fastest time and most chaotic uh, elements out here, and I would even put some of the you know, modern communication technologies up here on this kind of fashion layer now. Um, and then it goes down into commerce and infrastructure and governance, culture and nature moving the absolute slowest. And the idea was like, you know, how do we know when people are, are, are not acting in a, in a good way around long-term thinking? And you can imagine, you know, when, when Pacific Lumber got bought out by Maxam Corporation, and they owned the largest swaths of, of, of old growth redwoods in the Pacific Northwest, this was all done in this commercial layer, and Maxam Corporations, their main goal with all companies was to buy them and sell them for their assets. And that's one thing when that's, the assets are some buildings and some machinery, but in this case, Pacific Lumber's assets were old growth redwoods, which are down here. And they basically skipped all this, and were trying to sell off these millions of dollars of assets in a single generation where they couldn't be replaced. And then all, you know, all kind of hell broke loose politically, and, and that, you know, they partially were able to sell them off and they partially ended up getting saved and bought out by, by other interests. But it's these kind of moments where you skip a bunch of these layers that you realize you're, you're probably not doing long-term thinking right. And so I'm going to talk, as I mentioned, uh, about some of the things that have lasted in antiquity, some, some of the reasons why they have lasted. Um, but you'll kind of see, and, and along with that last example that I gave, is that for the most part, one of the things that we have really realized about um, trying to think about the future in a positive way is that when you're making decisions that give the future more options, you're probably doing it right. You know, the future will always have more information than we have, um, and we will always have less information than the future has. So um, many choices now are often made, you know, if you look at, let's say, something like the, uh, the Bill of Rights, where it's, 10 things, about a sentence and a half each. They were all very principle-based notions that are intended to be reinterpreted every single generation. Whereas a modern law is 1,200 pages long. No one's ever actually read it all. But it's very much intended to have no room for different interpretation by the future. Um, and you can see which ones of those seem to have better sticking power, um, the Bill of Rights or some of these modern laws that, that really don't even uh, a lot of people don't even know what's in all of them. Um, so I'm going to move over to the kind of mechanical side of what I do. My background is in industrial design. And as we have been designing this clock, I've been collecting d various examples of, of ways that things have lasted. And one of the, the most amazing examples is this one, which is the Antikythera device, which was a, a very small piece of uh, kind of corroded bronze that was found off the coast of Antikythera, Greece. And 
for a long time, people realized it was special that it had gearing and, and these markings, but it wasn't until they started doing x-rays and uh, other types of scans and then were able to reconstruct it that they realized it was actually an astronomical clock. It, was, it set back the date of, of a lot of gearing and, and astronomical knowledge uh, by almost 1,500 years once it was really understood what it was. It's pretty amazing in that sense, um, and no one's ever found anything quite like it. But the really interesting thing to me is that um, because it was mechanical, if this was, let's say, an electronic clock that had been on the seafloor for uh, 2,000 years, um, it would not have been, uh, there would be no way to reconstruct this. So, you know, why is, our, why is the clock that we're building electronic uh, or mechanical instead of electronic? It's because it, get, it has this kind of self-documenting feature. Even with, uh, you know, something as corroded as some of those pieces I showed you, they were still able to figure it out. So you want to be able to design something not only to work uh, in, in you know, its kind of designed operation state, but also in its failing operation state so that people can reconstruct it. Another interesting thing that happens uh, is this idea of sacrifice. And we, we, we often see this in nature with something like a lizard that can lose its tail and uh, still go on to live. But in antiquity, we also see it where something like the pyramids, uh, you know, they, the tombs were lost, the outer casing stones were eventually stripped off. But if the intent of the, of the original builders was to keep pyramids around for 5,000 years, there, that would have, this, this would have worked. And when people took off these outer, outer parts and stole the value from the inside, they kind of felt as though they'd extracted all the value from this. Um, and for probably the builders, they did. But if we imagine that the builder's intent was just to keep pyramids around for 5,000 years, um, then that, that would have been success. And you also see this in something like the Taj Mahal, where uh, the whole uh, insides of it were encrusted with all kinds of jewels. And when it was finally sacked by the British for the last time, they spent a long time prying all these jewels out of the walls. Um, and we still have this amazing architectural artifact that wasn't destroyed because they felt as though they'd extracted the value that they felt was just the gems. The other strategy um, is to make something remote. And this, this kind of has two elements to it. One is that there's also a kind of uh, a mystery that people are, are get intrigued by when things are remote. This is a picture of the seed vault in Svalbard. Uh, I was there a few winters ago. Uh, this is what it looks like when you're flying into the airport there. That's the, the airstrip. And it's, it's extremely remote. It's the most northern, uh, most permanently inhabited place on the planet. Uh, and the seed vault is meant to store a copy of crop seeds uh, from seed banks from around the world. Uh, which it does. What was amazing to me after traveling all the way there was this signing into this guest book. I was signing in behind Ban Ki Moon and Jimmy Carter, and you know, people. There's something about these remote sites that that people really find uh, really compelling, and kind of becomes part of this myth. Uh, in our case, hopefully, of long-term thinking that we want to promote. The other interesting tactic is to just take a really long time building something. Um, the the cathedrals of Europe are. Uh, are definitely in this vein. So this is the cathedral at Cologne. It was, uh, it took 600 years to build. It started in the 1200s and finished in the in the 1800s, and it's actually still kind of under construction. Um, but it, it helps pass this uh, this point. And, and and another cathedral that's a great example is La Familia in uh, in Barcelona, the Sagrada Familia. Sorry, um, and it. You know, it was, it's now on its fourth or fifth architect, most famous one being Gaudi. It's 125 years into building. It probably has another 125 years to go, but it's already a UNESCO World Heritage Site, even though it's a construction site. Uh, so it's, it's kind of past this very critical time that all of these things do, and we even see it here in San Francisco, of kind of one generation after something's built is the most dangerous time for anything to last, because it's kind of your parents' thing, it's not cool anymore, uh, and, but it, once it passes that generation, then it's kind of this antique, and then people want to keep it. And, the, and Sagrada Familia went through this very much, it was un, unworked on for a whole generation until somebody else picked it back up again. And 
In Japan, we see another strategy, which is that they're just really good at maintaining things. So these are two of the oldest continuously standing uh, wooden structures in the world. Um, and they've just been meticulously maintained in a very wet environment, uh, but they've kept the roof on. They've replaced things as they've gotten rotten. Um, but they're over uh, 1,400 years old, and they're made of wood. So even some of the most ephemeral materials can last for thousands of years. If, uh, if done right. In fact, there's an even more ephemeral material uh, temple site, a Shinto shrine that's, that's close to this one, where they rebuild the site every 20 years in an exact replica, and they've been doing that for over 1,600 years. And that's just thatch and wood. So it's, a, it's another way of this kind of renewal of, uh, of a design. It also keeps once a generation people actually, teach, you know, the master teaching an apprentice and going on. Uh, generation after generation. And um, another interesting problem that I've noticed is, is that you know, as, as you look around the world, most things that are designed to last for several thousand years are being put underground. But one of the big problems that happens there is that, uh, that people always think that they can keep the water out. Uh, what I've learned is that you can divert water. You can't stop water. Um, so you can choose where water wants to go. Uh, this was the last picture they let me take before going into the Mormon genealogical archives outside of Salt Lake City. Um, I did find some pictures from inside there, amazingly. But the Mormon uh, archives were built in this bunker, um, and the goal was to keep the water out. And uh, the, all, of those, the, all of those drawers that were in that last slide, the whole, all the bottom ones they don't keep filled because it's already flooded like five times in the 40 years it's been around. Um, and the, uh, they, they, they basically can't keep the water out, so um, all they do is they've dug trenches under the vault doors to let the water through the, the site. And this is a, actually a picture of the pumps at the, that they had to install at the seed vault in Svalbard. And uh, the other underground sites, like the nuclear waste sites, um, are also already having these problems even before nuclear waste gets put in them. So it's, uh, it's, it's an interesting thing that many of these sites have chosen to be underground, but they have uh, unfortunately thought that they can stop the water. And the last one that I'll mention is this idea of ideology. This is a picture, uh, before and after pictures, of the Buddhas at Bamiyan in Afghanistan. This is a person to give you an idea of scale there. They're massive. But the Taliban spent uh, weeks uh, dynamiting those Buddhas out of that cliff face. Um, for an ideology as kind of innocuous as Buddhism, that's pretty impressive. And, and you know, Long now does have an ideology, so this ideology of long-term thinking. Um, and I think this is one of the most, the largest dangers in trying to create something that's going to last for a very long time. Is uh, you never know who's going to choose to take that on as a uh, as an enemy. Uh, as I mentioned before, I get into the clock. Um, Stuart Brand had talked about uh, this idea of a very long-term library, and, um, and Alex mentioned the Rosetta Project, so I just did just want to touch on it. Uh, early on in, in this, we realized we, you know, we needed something that could also record culture over the kind of time scale that we're talking about, not just inspire people to think long-term. And we looked at this, you know, the Rosetta Stone itself, which had uh, two languages and three different scripts, and it was kind of the key to deciphering hieroglyphics. Um, but that, even with that, it took 50 years of, of effort to decode hieroglyphics. Uh, it's also another good example of how, uh, pretty much how bad, really, uh, pictographic languages are. And we often think, like, oh, if you're going to want to last something, if you want something to last for a really long time, just draw pictures and everyone will understand. But it turns out pictures are super laden with culture. They're the most difficult things to understand. It's way easier to, to decode something like a, a, an alphabet that's phonetic like ours. And so we thought we wanted to make a modern version of this. And so what we did, we spent about a decade collecting uh, parallel languages and, and 10 different elements of languages, a parallel text, uh, a map of where it's found, a basic description of it. And then instead of it etching it into stone, we could take these thousands of pages and use a gallium ion beam, the same technology that's used for microcircuits, and just write the actual text into silicon and then plate on top of that uh, metals that can last for a long time, like nickel or rhodium. And so we put uh, 13 and a half thousand pages of language documentation on this disk, uh, one of which was launched on the European Space Agency's Rosetta mission. If you remember, uh, just a few years ago, uh, the spacecraft landed on 
this comet, and so it's, it's now our piece of uh, language documentation that's going to continue to orbit the sun in perpetuity. So the clock. This is the project that uh, I have been working on for 21 plus years now. Uh, we started with a, a prototype uh, that we finished in 1999. Uh, that one's now at the Science Museum in London. And then in 2005, Jeff Bezos, uh, founder of Amazon, came on to fund the full-scale version that we're, that we're now building. And uh, so I'm going to talk about just kind of a couple of the design problems that we've solved in working on the clock. And uh, this is a, a picture of the sun at noon throughout the course of the year. This is what's called the analemma. And this is, uh, so the summer solstice is at the top, winter solstice at the bottom, the equinox. And the reason I'm showing this is that the clock that we wanted to build, we wanted to have a way for it to not drift uh, its timing over the course of 10,000 years. So we wanted a way to synchronize it mechanically to the sun on any sunny day. But we also wanted it to be able to keep time between those sunny days with a pendulum that's keeping what's called absolute time. So the difference between solar time and absolute time is this kind of plus or minus 15 minute difference here. And then it varies throughout the course of the year. So normally, if you wanted to have a pendulum keeping absolute time and this synchronizing to the sun, all you'd have to do is make a, a cam that kind of corrects for this one analemma. But the problem is, if you're trying to build a 10,000-year clock, the Earth is also processing on its poles every 26,000 years, and it's slowing its rotational rate by about a second a century. So all of that had to go into a shape that, is, that turns around once per year, but is read over the course of over 10,000 years to give us that plus or minus 15 minute difference as it evolves for 10,000 years. So this is kind of, uh, this one shape is that equation of time as it changes. Uh, we left, we'd made this a 12,000 year cam, so you had 1,000 years in the beginning, 1,000 years in the end to make a new cam. The, uh, the site that we're building at now uh, is in West Texas, the very first uh, site that we, we actually purchased a site in Eastern Nevada uh, that was in the Great Basin National Park uh, that's covered in uh, some of the oldest trees in the world, bristle cones, which was an amazing site, but it also became very difficult permitting-wise. And uh, Jeff Bezos, when he came on with the funding for this project, uh, he was also buying some of these ranch properties in West Texas for his Blue Origin launch facility. And uh, we found this amazing site that's karst limestone, something that we can carve in underground. Um, it's also very close to Carlsbad Caverns. We knew that it could support underground structures, in that case, for 60 million years. Uh, and so in our case, we just needed the 10,000. And in uh, 2010, we started the underground work. So we were going to, the goal was to build uh, an underground structure that started, oh, sorry that started looking like this kind of rough old mining entrance. And then uh, as you move through it by the end and seeing the whole clock, it would then look like this uh, very, uh, very man-made, uh, totally uh, smooth-hewn project. And as, as you saw before, you know, there's, there's one type of, of underground work that's the kind of the earliest way, which is using explosives to, um, to work. And that's, that makes very rough surfaces. So that worked for the beginning of our project. But then we had this design where we wanted to have this kind of like forced perspective, spiral staircase, underground space where we're working, basically carving very smooth surfaces underground. Uh, and we found in Carrara, Italy, they do this, but just to do to work effectively in the positive, just to cut big blocks of, of stone out from under the ground. And so we borrowed one of this, these d uh, nine foot diamond chainsaws from them, and we built a 36,000 pound diamond chainsaw robot that uh, has been working, well now it's done now. It spent two years uh, cutting plate by plate uh, out from underground and then once you break out the plates between those cuts, we were left with what we wanted, which was both a kind of a hall space and um, 350 feet, vertical feet of diamond cut stairs. And that just finished up about a year ago. 
and that's before the railing got installed. That's kind of the nervous time. It's a 500 vertical foot uh, hole, so uh, working there is a little bit tense. The, um, the other parts of the clock, and we're not done with the clock, um, but uh, a lot of it is, is getting very close to, to being done. Um, I'm going to show you a little bit about the chime generator and the power system. The power system, uh, and I'll be able to show you some images, in fact, of the power system, which we just installed on site in West Texas. The, uh, the chime generator that we built, uh, this is the very first prototype of it, uh, where it can ring a series of 10 bells in a different sequence each day for 10,000 years. So when I mentioned uh, that Danny wanted to build effectively the slowest computer in the world, this is kind of one of those. It's, uh, it can do you know, 10 factorial, which if you do that math, it does come out about 70,000 days short of, uh, of once per day for the entire 10,000 years. But the, be the bells only ring on the days that people are there to wind the clock. So we assume there'll be a few missed days. Um, but then we needed to scale that design up to this kind of thing that's in the spiral staircase that, uh, that people would experience on this kind of architectural scale. And that's what we've been building uh, largely out of parts that are uh, machined up in Seattle. But then this is our shop uh, right up here in San Rafael. Each one of these uh, module layers rings a bell, and there'll be bells hung between them. And there's 10 of them, and it go, it'll be 80 feet tall. And that's the next thing that we install at the site. It's a 60,000 pound uh, bell ringing device that we're going to be lowering in in the next few months. And the power system was an interesting problem. With the, with the first prototype of the clock that we built, we realized that there wasn't really a way for people to interact with the clock. And we, um, without someone being able to kind of own the moment that they have with it, it didn't really have the effect that we were after. And so we realized that we did want people to wind the clock, but we also didn't want it to lose time when people weren't there to wind it. And so what we ended up with was a kind of a two-part system where the, the clock is, the part of the clock that keeps the time is wound by the temperature difference from day to night. There's, at the very top of this mountain, there's a tank of air that expands uh, when it gets warm, and a metal bellows expands, and we get just enough energy, basically, to keep the pendulum ticking and to know where the now point is. But to show you that now point, and for all the chimes to ring that use all the energy for those bells, uh, we, uh, we require that people wind it. So when people come, they wind the clock all the way up, and they're rewarded with the bells ringing and the, all the different dials updating. And so once you get into this kind of level of human interac interaction with big mechanical things, um, we had to build some of these very large gears and also really we're doing effectively experience design. We're kind of designing a ride uh, that or we're trying to change the way people think from the beginning to the end of that ride uh, and work with a very large machine that's effectively storing 15,000 pounds of weight that can fall over 100 feet. And one of the, the most difficult problems that we had early on in this project was bearings. Uh, if you're trying to make uh, something that rolls over something else that lasts for thousands of years out of metal, it's very, very difficult. Uh, and when I started on this project, the, um, I found the right solution, and it was a bearing that was developed for satellites, and it's these ceramic bearings that are kind of engineered diamond hard ceramics, and they don't rust, they don't weld to themselves, they don't need lubrication, they're designed to work in, the, in space, but they cost about $60,000 each 22 years ago. Um, but now they're in fidget spinners and rollerblades and they cost $5. So um, it was one of those very happy accidents of technology that, uh, that allows us to basically every single uh, moving part in this clock is using ceramic bearings of some kind, either with metal races for some of the very large ones or ceramic on ceramic bearings. And uh, this is the power system as it was being test assembled uh, at the shop. And this is us putting it in literally just a few weeks ago at the site. So for each one of these builds, we, we have to build a temporary work deck, which we're working on there. It's a 150-foot fall from where we're working otherwise, but even so, we're all working on tethers. Um, and everything comes from the surface, partially assembled.
in some cases is assembled with thermal fitting with that torch. That's the temporary deck getting installed for the next level. And that's the 15,000 pound weight that stores uh, energy for the clock over, uh, over time. And the, um, basically it can, it can even run for over a century uh, without being wound by people just, just from that itself. And this is our amazing crew of, of engineers who've been working on this. Um, so I'm just going to show you some of these last few slides of, that, I, that I took um, while doing these last installs, um, just to give you an idea of the scale. Um, the next thing, as I mentioned, is going to be the chime generator, and then the dials, and then the parts that go at the top that uh, do the self-winding and the solar synchronizing. Um, we were just there. Uh, the, the very last thing that we did was hook up the winder. And uh, so these guys are winding the clock for the first time. And that, that big uh, kind of thing in the middle there is a rack gear that's being wound up with the weight on it. And you can tell it moves very, very slowly. It would take probably uh, a whole day of winding to bring it up to the top. And just a couple other local things that I'll mention since you guys are here in San Francisco. Um, some of you may have been to Fort Mason. Uh, our headquarters are, uh, are right there next to Green's Restaurant. We actually have a bar and cafe called The Interval um, that we operate downstairs of our office, and we also do a lecture series there on long-term thinking. And then Stuart Brand hosts a series mostly at SF Jazz on long-term thinking. Um, last night at The Interval, we had Brian Bellendorf, one of the early founders of Open Source Movement and Linux. And uh, on Monday at SF Jazz, we have Juan Bennett, uh, talking about long-term infrastructure uh, using blockchain technology for uh, file sharing. And with that, I can take questions. Uh, could you talk a bit about maintainability? There's all these like really large gears that you've machined and the ceramic ball bearings. Like, How do you expect people in 5,000 years to be able to <clears throat> replace parts if they need to or anything like that? Well, uh, the tolerances that we operate on are actually very, very sloppy in the comparison to modern machining techniques. We are using modern machining techniques, but, um, but actually you could cast these same parts out of bronze and still do it, which would be kind of 5,000 years ago technology. Um, we have made um, we have made m as much of the clock as possible disassemblable and carry outable, um, but we also are trying to balance that against people stealing parts of it over time. Um, so you can um, the parts that you need to get to you can without taking the entire clock apart, like to replace a bearing or something like that. You could replace any of the bearings that we are putting in the clock with s stainless steel bearings or some future material that is maybe better than even than ceramics as well. Our goal was that we, you know, we tested all of the cycles to the number that they need to do and beyond uh, in making the clock, but that's not to say that something won't happen that causes that maintenance to be needed, but our hope is that uh, at least kind of very large-scale maintenance does not have to happen. Yeah, hi. Um, just want to make sure you could hear me. Uh, so two questions. First is, when do you expect the construction on the clock to be completely finished and open to the public? And then the second, um, I don't know if you necessarily answered this, but you know, why a clock? If you want to inspire people to think long term, you know, you brought up the uh, concept of library. You were certainly um, you know quick to bring up like Sagrada Familia and some of the other like, you know, why is it that it was a clock that was finally decided upon? Um, yeah. So uh, I'll take the last one first. The um, I mean, I think it really could have been anything. And I, and I think there's also the question of, you know, why a monument scale clock, right? And um, the, the goal was to, to create a kind of a, you know, in a way, a theatrical experience that changes the way people think about time. And if we're going to, um, if we're going to do that on this human scale, I mean, you could pick, uh, there's all kinds of ways to build a 10,000 year clock. You could plant forests every, you know, kind of pie shape of forest every hundred years or something like that. So there's, a, there's many ways to do it, but um, we were looking for something that would create, that would hold an image in people's minds 
that they would want to travel to, or even if they never traveled to, they would still kind of be able to hold as a reference in their lives as an as a, as a object that was made by people that was designed to last for that long. Um, and since it's about time, the clock just seems to make sense in that, in that scale. Um, yeah, so I think um, there's, there's all kinds of ways to do it. This is one of the ways that we chose. We also, as I mentioned, we have many other projects. Um, we also have a project on you know, betting of, on long-term things of scientific and social consequence. Um, we have the, the Rosetta Project and lectures. But I think you know, if, you're, if you were, we could have just released a white paper on long-term thinking, but um, you know, how effective is that in terms of actually making new stories and new myths and new cultural memes? Probably not very effective. Um, so we wanted something that people would actually tell stories about. And um, we've been lucky that there's already been, even we're not done with the clock, we had, you know, Neil Stevenson wrote a book called Anathem, uh, who's, and it was a New York Times bestselling science fiction book that was about a world with 10,000 year clocks in it. So, you know, we're starting to get the right new stories told. Uh, hopefully there will be more. Did I, you had another question uh, to put? Yeah. Oh, when it'll be done. Yeah, um, we don't have an end date. We've never worked towards an end date or with an end date. Uh, we're very lucky to have a patron that allows that. Um, and um, the goal has always been to just do it right. And uh, but I, I'd say, you know, we're as you can see, we're vastly more far along than we were two decades ago. And um, we're now at the point where working pretty quickly is, is required just kind of from an efficiency standpoint, where every, we have everybody that's designed it, still on the team. They all go there for the installation. We don't want to lose those people uh, to other projects as we, as we finish this. So we're trying to work pretty, uh, pretty effectively. So it's feeling like years, not decades at this point. I, I guess just uh, uh, get the press on the fence. So like, if we want to do this, it's like, when would it be open to the public? We will see. <laughs> it will be open to the public, but mm -hmm. yes. But it's not. Not yet. Uh, if we could do one question from the Dory, the online questions. Uh, someone actually asked about the novel Anathem that you mentioned, um, and uh, specifically asked, did the events described in the novel in turn inspire any changes in the 10,000 year clock work that's ongoing? Um, that's an interesting question. I think, I mean, we refer to that novel, and it, so just to catch everybody up, I won't, without giving any spoilers, it was a, it was a, a world, not this world, um, but um, kind of in a parallel universe that um, the only academic people in the world lived in these uh, kind of cathedral-like things that had these either a century clock or a thousand-year clock or a 10,000-year clock. And uh, the rest of the entire world was basically kind of like mall culture. Um, and so all of the academic thinking and long-term thinking happened uh, in, these, uh, in these cathedrals. Um, and, were, and so the, it was kind of like monks, but they weren't a religion. They were a religion of long-term thinking in a way. And um, so uh, I think we have often referred to the book in the sense of like, who is going to be the, the people who um, help either maintain or um, are the kind of docents of this experience uh, or just protect it. Um, and so that I think has inf been informed by that a little bit. Uh, thank you. Uh, do you have any thoughts about what Google can do to influence long-term thinking? Uh, yeah, what can Google do? I mean, I think w one of the problems that we started working on and one of the reasons the Rosetta Project came up um, and we did it in this extremely analog method of uh, something that you can put under a microscope and read rather than on floppy disks or hard disks or whatever. Uh, was because we realized we're, we're effectively archiving the world's culture at this point uh, as born digital information um, or retroactively scanning it in. Um, and you know, a thousand years ago, we wrote things down on rocks and you can still read the rocks. And a hundred years ago, we wrote things down on books and you can still read the books. 20 years ago, we wrote things down with some of the early databases, which are all totally lost, right? And um, we have definitely have some of some great advantages now to things are much more connected and things are in a way more interoperable because of the internet. But we are not archiving things the way that uh, that can be necessarily read in thousands of years. And um, so as 
I think that Google is in a, a unique position, obviously, of having so much data, so much, so much writing material. I mean, if, if the modern William Shakespeare was writing now, would you be able to read that content 500 years from now? Is an interesting kind of question to ask yourself. And uh, you know, the, the design principle that we use on the clock is if we burrowed into the mountain and we found the clock already there, what do we wish we had found? And so I might ask you to think about the ways that information is being created and stored that if you found it a thousand years from now, what do you wish you had done to make sure that that data was saved? Uh, we'll just alternate with the Dory. Um, someone asked about the sky map at the Hoover Dam. Are you familiar with that? Oh, yeah. And do you have any, any comment to add? Um, yeah, so there's a, there's a very interesting site um, that is uh, very poorly documented. And if you have ever visited the Hoover Dam, you probably have visited it and not known it. But as you, um, as you come down onto the dam, which now I guess you can walk on, but you can't drive vehicles on, they have a new overpass, um, there's an inlaid floor that was done by an artist named, last name of Hansen, I believe. Uh, and, it's, and then there's these two beautiful uh, statues next to it. And what he did was he used the procession of the equinoxes that I mentioned that our cam references to, um, to make an image of the, of the night sky and the major planets and stars um, the day that the Hoover Dam was, was uh, commissioned effectively. And so setting in, t in time the date of when the, the Hoover Dam was built in this floor, uh, terrazzo floor, that is absolutely it's super beautiful and it's super well thought out and super well done. Um, unfortunately, that whole site is run by the Bureau of Land Reclamation, which is not the most future thinking uh, site or one that cares much about this. So they have almost no information about it. I was able to talk them out of um, sending me the blueprints for it. And uh, I scanned those and put them up on the Internet Archive and did a whole blog piece on the Long Now blog. If you're for people who are interested, I think it's probably the most documentation that that site has. Um, and it's a, it's a really cool one. And if you're ever at the Hoover Dam, you can impress your friends by pointing it out. So it's two questions. So they probably you, the first one you probably answered, like, Say the clock is ready and the next day something like the rapture occurs and every, every human being disappears. Do you expect the clock to work actually 10,000 years with no one actually looking at it? And the second actually has to do with the, the, like the Japanese approach or the temple approach, you know, the Japanese one. Like there's two ways to do it, like the statical thing that is meant to work or some kind of evolutionary thing that you would depend on some kind of mission that actually holds itself to advance, right? Because in 5,000 years, say, every kind of language or reference to English, the United States, uh, or human like uh, culture disappears, uh, are, you, are we able to get some kind of other culture to understand what this is? Like, is it self-documented enough? Or because if you have like this kind of, um, I don't know, mission that actually can keep going on generation to generation, which one do you think is more reliable? Both have risks. Right? Um, yeah, I mean, I think the probably the largest risk to the clock is people, but the the reason we're building it is for people. So you know, we designed it very much uh, for people and to work with people. But um, you know, we we did we have done we have made best efforts to make sure that everything will work for ten thousand years all by itself. The dials wouldn't update, but it would still know when now is, and if someone showed up at the end of that ten thousand years, they could wind it and get there. Um, the question of um, if the, uh, sorry, the last question was about? Um, uh, kind of approaches that you can take like this problem of. Oh, the incremental approach, yeah. So uh, again, the goal here was to get, make something that people would tell stories about. And I think, um, you know, people do tell stories about some of these other things like the, um, the, the Shinto shrine at Issei um, and certainly whole there's whole belief systems that, um, that that's central to. And so that's a totally reasonable one. Um, this was just kind of the one that we chose to give a try. Uh, and so the, the documentation part of it, we, that Rosetta disk that I mentioned, um, we did put all the plans of the clock on that disk uh, and have continued to update them as some of the new versions of that disk has come out and uh, gives us a way to document over very long periods of time. 
Or is there anybody else? Can we take one more? Sure. Um, so there's a there's a bunch of questions online about sort of the, you know, the long-term resistance of the clock, the Earth is in motion, complex system, all that stuff. Um, so maybe just a, a couple of those. Um, someone asked uh, what would happen in the event of an earthquake if it's resistant. And there's another question about um, how much change can be tolerated in the temperature difference that actually powers the clock. Uh, good questions. Yeah. So um, the earthquake thing, we you know we're building in West Texas, which is it's not the most stable tectonic place on on the Earth. Something like Australia probably would be. Um, but it's pretty stable, and um, we started with a geologic report that basically said um, that we're up to a 6.0 may happen. It's a one in 10,000 chance that a 6.0 will happen in 10, 000, over the course of 10,000 years. So we uh, we went with 6.0 as our Richter scale design, um, and even did some simulations of that big weight that was hanging to see if it would swing in weird ways and rack into things. Um, and, uh, and made a few modifications to, to deal with those kind of waves that might come through the site because of that. Um, as I mentioned, we're, in, we're very close to Carlsbad um, caverns, and those caverns are built in the exact same, or built where they were, they were formed in the same limestone and have lasted between two and 60 million years. So the underground space is pretty darn, um, I think, resilient on the kind of time scale that we're talking about. And uh, what was the last one? Uh, temperature difference, how much could be, could be yes. tolerated? Um, yeah, so the temperature, the thing that, that uh, synchronizes the clock to the sun as well as the thing that uh, pulls energy is a differential engine. It is not a absolute engine. Um, and so uh, there's a, the air system is kind of, it's the, the seals on it are ceramic and uh, the piston is graphite. And so it, it's not like sealed with rubber. Uh, we didn't think there's any kind of seals like that that would last anyway, but they basically let a little bit of air by. So um, they're always um, finding a kind of, the design was to find a, about a week long equilibrium of what average temperature was to then have a tank that, that's getting heated by the sun to give you a difference. And so even some of the places like Antarctica um, have, uh, or some of the hottest deserts in the world, they still have huge differences between day and night temperature, even though their uh, their absolutes are much more extreme than we are now. So, should work. We'll see. Thank you, everybody.